This is a comparison of three skulls of modern and archaic human skulls. So first up, I'm going to show you a modern human skull. I should mention that all of these are casts of the originals with some reconstruction work going into them. Um, I'm just going to move quickly through this because um, I suppose the, the interesting parts are really in the comparisons. So this is a side profile. Okay, next we're going to move to a Cro-Magnon skull. Now, the Cro-Magnons were classically described as early modern humans, and now they're used to denote early modern humans in Europe. Uh, the first radiocarbon dating is about 35,000 years ago. This specimen is estimated to be between 10 and 30,000 years ago and was recovered from a gravel pit. The age has been determined from the associated animal findings. Unfortunately, a number of the upper teeth are missing. Let's bring back the modern human skull. Now, the Cro-Magnon skull looks a little bit shorter vertically but that's because of the collapse due to the loss of the teeth if you notice on the right hand side the the chin is very prominent on the Cro-Magnon specimen the orbital region um, the eye sockets in other words in the Cro-Magnon specimen, appear slightly larger than the modern human. If you also look here, you see the orbital, supraorbital ridge is quite pronounced. There's a little bit of a, a brow there compared to the modern human. So now what I'm going to do is bring up Another specimen, this time a classic Neanderthal. Okay, so almost immediately this specimen is looking quite different to the other two. Um, let's bring up a modern human for comparison. Now, I suppose if you just look directly at uh, the skulls um, face on, what you'll notice is that the orbital region, the, the eye sockets, and the Neanderthal skull 
a very large in comparison to the human skull. Also the brow ridge, this, this is really defining the uh, Neanderthals. It's a very pronounced, thick, bony ridge, which is completely different from the human skull. You also notice that the uh, the nasal region, the the sinuses, are uh, and the 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 ethmoid plate are obviously missing from the Neanderthal skull, um, possibly due to damage of the original specimen. But what is is fairly evident and is repeated in other findings is that. The, this nasal opening in the Neanderthals is much, much larger than in humans. And the idea here was that Neanderthals have just a very large nose that's filled with lots of mucus, cover, uh, mucus to warm the air as it enters, as it breathes through the nose. And that would be useful for the environment it was living in because it was freezing cold so this was thought to be a way that the Neanderthals adapted to their environment now something that isn't really often commented on but is fairly obvious if you look at these specimens is the teeth so if you look at the human teeth here we've got all the usual incisors and canines and molars and premolars and then if we just move this aside and look at the Neanderthal you know what just what is going on here this is just remarkable this Neanderthal specimen has, has basically just looks as though all of the teeth be being filed down and just get some indication here this is this is the human uh, jawbone the mandible and this is the neanderthal Give you some comparisons here. What's obvious is that these, in this specimen at least, these Neanderthal teeth are just massive and the, the jawbone is, is just massive in comparison to, to the human uh, one. And what's also very interesting is that these lower teeth at the front, the incisors, are actually aligned at 90 degrees to the human equivalent. Now, I'm not sure if this is just some result of compression of the jawbone over a lengthy period of time. But basically, it looks as though the Neanderthals have their teeth, the lower teeth, orientated in a completely different direction. And they've had them chis chiseled down or filed down. It looks, it looks as though that might have happened. What's also impressive is that the Neanderthal has a full set of teeth.
so for the next surprise I think it's useful just to have a look from from the side so what we're going to do is just turn the skulls around and just have a side profile and just examine or compare compare the the brain cases So again, I find this just remarkable. The if we go here from the chin, or rather the where the chin is in humans, because Neanderthals famously don't have a chin. So sorry about that. Um, we go all the way back here to the occipital region, the uh, the very back of the of the skull. We see there's just this massive and. Um, distance, the anterior, posterior uh, distance from the base of the skull and, and the, the vertex through to the uh, tip of the mandible. And what we also see here is this zygomatic arch which is just very thickened compared to <coughs> human equivalent. Now if we look at the human, modern human, we see a very thin zygomatic arch. We see a very short, more upright skull. So people would think there's there's more frontal lobe development in, in modern humans. But actually when you look at the brain endocast you find that what's happened is it's just it's just the way the Neanderthal brain case is is structured, and to me it looks almost as though in this specimen the Neanderthal is 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 almost protecting its brain case. It's got this what I like to think of as an industrial strength face. This is you know this thickened brow ridge, the thickened zygomatic arch, the thick, chunky mandible, all of these things are just looking as though they're built to protect it. And it's understandable because in that environment, the Neanderthal was up against the cave bear, massive, a massive creature, bigger than current day brown bears. It was up against the saber-toothed tiger, the cave lion, uh, the woolly mammoth, all of these massive creatures, uh, the woolly rhinoceros, um, and it was fighting for its survival. What's also remarkable here is in this specimen, the brain capacity, the, or the cranial capacity, I should say, sorry, is 1600 cc. You can't directly go from the cranial capacity to the, the brain volume. Um, you have to get an endocast to see what impressions the brain has left on the on the skull interior of the skull case, but it's a fairly good indicator of, of what the brain volume is likely to be. And here we have a, a modern human, much smaller cranial capacity in comparison. Now, one final comparison I'm going to make is, again, to compare the Cro-Magnon and the modern human from a side profile.